Uh, it has been two days, three days since uh, China traversed our air our airspace with a balloon. My God, why are we not at war yet? Shouldn't we have fired nuclear missiles by now? This was. Have you ever been taunted by a balloon? I. How could they? Uh, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, first, we'll, we'll start with Jessica. Is it your sense that America is slightly overreacting to what is a banal provocation between two countries that are so intertwined economically and, and security-wise? W- what do you think is happening? I think it's a really unfortunate symbol of where we are at this point in our relationship with China. Mm -hmm. I think that there was definitely a degree of domestic overreaction, particularly on Twitter and amongst a member of the commentariat, including sitting members of Congress. I would say the administration, uh, you know, handled it pretty prudently. Mm -hmm. But, you know, ultimately, I think their hand was a bit forced by the domestic outcry. There's a looming symbol in our sky of something alien. Um, nonetheless, I think this was really a blunder on the, the Chinese side in terms of the probably the left hand not knowing exactly what the right hand was doing uh, on the eve of uh, Secretary Blinken's visit the first time in several years to China. Um, and so it really, I think, has uh, unfortunately, I think, made it harder to get to that place of greater stability in the U.S.-China relationship that that visit by Secretary Blinken was was really aiming at. Jessica brings up an excellent point, John, which is an overreaction by our commentariat uh, and Twitter and a government that reacts. And the only question I have about the prudent response from the United States is it it was a balloon and we (laughs) shot it down with, I think, a missile from a $200 million airplane when, from what I understand, and I've been to Coney Island many times, I think a dart may have done it. I think we could have done it with a tack, maybe a pin, something along those lines. Uh, What's your thoughts on, on that idea that we've overreacted to a, a, a sort of banal provocation. Yeah, I think we're overreacting. And I think threat inflation is kind of baked into a lot of U.S. foreign policy. Mm-hmm. And I think back to, there's a famous, cla- it used to be classified document from the early Cold War called NSC 68. And the United States did something weird after the Second World War. Previous wars, we'd always demobilized after the war ended Mm -hmm. and stopped spending so much money. And we didn't do that after World War II because the Cold War set in. And leadership, I think, had to face a challenge. How do we convince, how do we maintain public support for having this sprawling global military presence that we're not going to leave Europe and not going to leave Asia? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they started, they said, I think in someone's memoirs, they said, we need to make it clearer than truth. So they hyped the Soviet threat. Um, they made it scarier than it really was. They made right. it seem more threatening than it really was. You think about 9-11, right? What was our reaction to terrorism? It was basically, it was the political equivalent of lighting our hair on fire. Right. Um, we uh, ended up fighting a number of unnecessary lengthy wars, expending enormous blood and treasure. We changed our whole domestic system around based on the notion that we would have like another 9-11 every couple of years. Right. You know, it was a harbinger of things to come as opposed to a kind of lucky shot. Right. Um, so we exaggerated the threat of terrorism to maintain, uh, you know, military operations in a number of countries with no borders or no, uh, no end in sight, no, no victory that we can then come home from. Um, and so it's very baked in. About, about existential threats. It's always everything is existential. Terrorism is an existential threat. Uh, Jessica, you know, John makes a point. We're coming out of 20 years of the global war on terror. We rewrote our intelligence policies. Uh, we all have to still take off our shoes uh, so that we, sh- we show the terrorists that they can't take away our freedoms, but they can take away our, our shoes. But immediately after pulling out of Afghanistan, I noticed the commentary at Everything shifted to now we're in the era of great world rivalry again, great world power rivalry. And China, remember when we told you it was the global war on terror that was the existential threat? What we meant was it's China and it's Russia and it's existential again. Where, where are we in that? Is, is this a calculated move? Or do they just not know what to do with themselves with this military industrial apparatus? 
and they have to shift it to something. You know, I think there are a lot of different factors at work here, uh, mm-hmm. John, and I don't want to say that this is all uh, kind of an instrumental ploy uh, to pad budgets, although there may be an aspect of that taking place. I do think that there is, at the heart of it, a kind of strategic diagnosis that uh, you know China seeks to supplant the United States as the sole global superpower, and it has just been biding its time for decades while we were, mm-hmm. you know, actually working together, frankly, in the war on terror. Um, and now that China has, you know, uh, you know, emerged more powerful, more capable, it's now finally, you know, looking to take its place in the sun. Now, I want to say that that's a strategic diagnosis that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think that there is that uh, sort of that underpinning here um, that leads many to see this in, if not existential terms, nonetheless, uh, you know, deeply threatening to uh, all that that they hold dear. And I would say that here where I think we've gone a little bit astray is assuming the worst uh, of China, assuming that China has uh, these maximalist intentions to really replace us um, as at, at the top. Whereas I think even in the words of the you know, U.S. intelligence community in the 2022 threat assessment, uh, you know, that China seeks to become the preeminent regional power and a major uh, player or major power on the global stage. And so I think there's a big gap between a, a power that wants to, you know, be able to, you know, seek, you know, deference, uh, security for itself uh, globally, and then a degree of preponderance uh, in the region. That's very different from a country that, in the words of, you know, for example, the Trump administration, you know, seeks to rape the United States and subvert democracy around the globe. Like th- these are, you know, there's a big gap there, and I, I worry that we have, uh, in assuming uh, that China has these uh, maximalist assessments or at intentions, that uh, we are, in fact, headed down a path where we, uh, you know, give China little choice but to seek to take us out because we are going to prevent them uh, from gaining any kind of uh, influence uh, and standing. So that's, that. I think that's, it, that's the mindset that I want to talk about w- with you guys. This mindset that there is a global world order, we sit atop it, we are the dominant superpower, and if you if your economic engine of a billion uh, point two people point one point two billion people, if you are going to ascend, I'm afraid we're going to have to fight you. As opposed to it's a big world. Economic conditions change, military conditions change, and we have to cooperate to best coexist in this environment. I don't understand, and and part of it is the global war on terror in many ways, is what has allowed China quietly with their Belt and Road project in Africa to corner markets for uh, rare metals and those types of things. Our own interventionist ego has given them the space in the first place. And why can't we say it's a big world? Congratulations on your economic success. You're our biggest customer. We're your biggest customer. How are we going to do this, guys, rather than, oh, my God, you sent a balloon our way, everybody to the nuclear silos? Yeah, I think you basically hit the nail on the head. I think what we're talking about with the U.S.-China rivalry is we're talking about the United States has this identity uh, about this role that it's supposed to play in the world. Mm -hmm. And we are indispensable. We are this benevolent hegemon. We're supposed to provide public goods. We're the first... And we're the actor of first resort in this order. You know, <laughs> we, we design this order. Yes. It's ours. And yes. um, China's, China's rise in power is simply threatening that. And we're clinging to it and not thinking strategically. This is how I basically think it works. Outsized power mm-hmm. uh, leads states to adopt outsized interests. As, as a state's power expands, it's what it considers to be its interests also expands. And then we have this narrative about indispensability, and that requires exaggeration. When you're talking about foreign policy, the farther things get away from merely defending the country, mm-hmm. you have to exaggerate it in order to maintain public support. And then over time, new generations of elites are socialized into these ideas. Then you have special interests, not only bureaucratic, but mm-hmm. the military industrial complex. They all have an interest in keeping us hyped up and fearful and thinking that every threat is existential. 
I think politics generally give the advantage to hawks. Nobody wins voters really by saying we're right. being too tough on China. <laughs> um, and then right. finally, I think the news media is basically complicit in this hype and fear and threat inflation. Because Cause that's where that money comes from. That's, that's, they're incentivized for that. Yeah, but they want viewers and subscribers and that, that's how you get people to pay attention. And so it's this kind of uh, cycle in this feedback loop where everyone's fearful and everyone's exaggerating every conceivable threat. And it's not a real smart way to devise wise strategy. No, uh, I think to succinctly, absolute power apparently corrupts absolutely. And it is, you know, Jessica, th th this isn't so much on the, you know, China rivalry, but I wonder if World War II, if we learned the wrong message. The message in World War II was, uh, we saved the day. Uh, our military is what prevented the world from falling into darkness. And I don't necessarily disagree with, with some of that. But then afterwards, the idea was, well, let's stay in Germany and Japan through the Marshall Plan, and we'll rebuild it in our image. And we will create uh, uh, freewheeling democratic allies in regions that will allow us to expand even our military reach is the lesson that we seem to have learned, not only that we can influence the world, but we can control it. That we actually have the power to control through sanctions or military intervention or bombings or currency manipulations or all kinds of other levers to not just influence, but control. And is that why China is seen to us as this anomaly that we have to stop. I think that I would probably look at the end of the Cold War as a set of lessons that we need to be very careful about learning from, because I think right. that many are now taking China as the new Soviet Union, and we all you know, dust off that playbook at the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union collapsed, and I think that was when you saw you know, really an ex you know, growing willingness on the United States part to intervene overseas, you know, in addition to what we did during the early uh, aftermath of the uh, World War II. But really, mm -hmm. it was really in the 1990s and the early 2000s that we kind of went, I think, above and beyond in, in trying to remake other places uh, in our own sort of democratic image. Right. Well, we've been pulling coups, though. I mean, we've been <laughs> we've been cooing. And, and influencing in South America and everywhere else for, you know, and then there's the Korean War, like. Absolutely. We've been at this, we've been at this a while. We absolutely have. And, but I do think that we're at a really interesting point in our national conversation around endless war, yeah. around the wisdom of doing this, because you have even very hawkish voices like Representative Mike Gallagher staying in his op-ed or maybe it was in a recent interview that, you know, we no longer seek to, you know, transform others in our image. And, the, you know, and Jake Sullivan has said that, you know, we don't aim to transform China. And yet I think that there is, there is still a kind of an overhang of habits that we have gotten into in terms of our human rights policies, our sanctions, et cetera, where we are accustomed to, uh, you know, standing on the moral high ground and uh, using all the tools at our disposal to try to, you know, by persuasion, inducement, uh, threat, coercion, and to get other countries to, uh, you know, f fall into line. Right. And I think that there is, again, this sort of this disconnect here uh, between what we recognize is now kind of this new reality of a world in which we are no longer uh, enjoying the same degree of preponderance that we enjoyed either at the end of World War II or the end of the Cold War. Right. Um, but we haven't quite caught up, I think, in terms of our of our actions or rhetoric and our actions in, in many cases to kind of discipline ourselves to this new reality. And I think that means that we're, you know, still kind of in this pre still precarious uh, position of potentially provoking more of a kind of counter reaction to some of the you know more punitive coercive measures without the ability to kind of really you know back it up ultimately and by the way let's not kid ourselves you know this idea of a moral high ground that somehow uh our problem with china is their treatment of uyghurs or their labor camps like that's a joke like america's problem with china is they cornered the market on precious metals in africa and you know there are supply lines and we have to protect those. And, you know, globalization gutted our manufacturing sector. Like, I, I don't understand why we consistently pretend that this is all about, you know, we're one, 
you know, we're Diogenes looking for one just country that we can that we can play with. John, what what do you think of that? Well, I agree. I mean, um, the notion that you know U.S. policymakers really, really care about what's happening to the Uyghurs or for Taiwanese independence or for democracy in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't pass the smell test to me because they're they're also simultaneously, you know, for years we've been helping the Saudis bomb the smithereens out of a defenseless mm, and impoverished different. Yemen. That's that's for a delicious, delicious oil. That's a whole other mistake. Well, right. I mean, think about the 90s in Iraq, how many people died as a result of the sanctions that we insisted we keep on. Or the sanctions in Iran. In Iraq. We're always allying with brutal dictatorships. It's some brutal dictatorships won't obey us Mm -hmm. and fall in line. And therefore, we need to hype up the democracy and human rights rhetoric. Look, I think it's worth taking a look. It's Theory of mind is valuable in in international politics. You want to be able to have an understanding of the way your adversary sees things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth taking a look through China's strategic lens, so to speak. So first of all, they have this narrative of century century of humiliation. You know, this 19th and, and early 20th century, China was weak and taken advantage of by imperial powers. But what do they see when they look out? You know, they look they they see one of the highest concentrations in the world of U.S. military forces at the very, very southern end of the Japanese archipelago, right. pointed like a dagger. We added, I think we added four bases in the Philippines last week. We just added four bases in the Philippines. We've yeah. been beefing up our presence in Australia. We have tens of thousands of troops in, right. in uh, South Korea. We are the largest naval presence in the East and South China Seas, and we right. constantly patrol those seas in order to signal to China that we uh, are going to defy their sovereignty claims. It's a little bit provocative to China, considering that those sea lanes are the ones that they use to import much of their commodities through the Malacca Strait, particularly oil. You know, it's a major vulnerability for them. But John, couldn't you make the case, though, that we're just trying to now catch the balloons as they launch? That if you, yeah, can, see, if you can get the balloon before it gets to 30,000 feet. Well, just think about if the reverse was the case. Yes. I mean, the United States, as you said, used its most advanced warplane to shoot out a balloon of the sky. <laughs> and and uh, we're, we're... By the way, first air-to-air kill for the F-22 was the yeah. balloon. That's the and, first... You know, I think... Uh, I think if, if any of that was going, we have the Monroe Doctrine. We have, we're very itchy about people getting in our neighborhood. Sure, And sure. we're all over China's neighborhood. And we're provoking them on some of their most sensitive issues. So, uh, you know, we shouldn't be surprised if they're on their haunches. And we right. should control ourselves and try not to get hysterical over things like balloons or, you know, China's yeah. uh, growing power. And, and Jessica, this is not to suggest that China and the United States are not rivals, but, you know, rivals is different than adversaries, is different than enemies. And we are turning a rivalry into an adversary, into an enemy, just through g- the gravity of our reaction cycle. Is China playing into that as well? Because Look, if it's good politics for us in a nationalist way, it's probably good politics for China in a nationalist way. Everybody loves an enemy. Is that how it's being perceived over there as well? You know, John, I think that sort of these political dynamics on both sides, the worst tendencies on both sides feed the other and give the other side evidence to say, here, look, you know, we are really, there is no possibility of of a peaceful coexistence, even though I think that there are plenty of you know, pragmatists in both capitals. And frankly, I think the leadership in both you know, countries right now doesn't want a war, doesn't want to uh, let this rivalry descend into, you know, open conflict. Um, but that said, they, you know, do face pressures, you know, and especially in the face of something that seems to be flagrantly provocative, they do need to respond in ways that are, you know, enable them to signal kind of that toughness that they're not going to be pushed around. And that's you know, I think a lot of the kind of rhetoric that we are, you know, hearing out of China on the kind of dare to struggle and be good at fighting. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just, you know, in conversations with Chinese, you know, colleagues over virtual Zoom, um, you know, whereas essentially this is a defensive measure. They feel existentially threatened by our continued, uh, you know, dominance and unwillingness to, uh, you know, even allow China to 
uh, continue to develop uh, it kind of not not just at the kind of base level of economics, um, but in terms of particularly high tech you know growth areas, uh, ranging from semiconductors to you know clean tech and biotech. And then I think mm-hmm. they're most concerned about the direction of travel in terms of U.S. policy uh, toward Taiwan. Uh, you know where we you know for decades have. Uh, not recognize Taiwan as an independent state, but now you have, uh, you know, former policymakers, including, uh, you know, Mike Pompeo, and and there's a you know, resolution in Congress calling for the United States to recognize Taiwan uh, as an independent uh, entity, and so you know that's you know throwing out the notion of uh, one China, uh, you know, that we have this policy, they have a principle. Nonetheless, it's really, uh, you know, suggesting that we are on this most important issue. Uh, to Chinese Communist Party leaders, saying that it's just no longer something that we just need to manage. We're just going to, uh, you know, completely, uh, you know, overturn the kind of modus vivendi that has, you know, prevented, uh, you know, outright conflict in the Taiwan Strait for decades. Let's be realistic about n- nobody's really, uh, you know, preventing anybody from, you know, this idea of China being uh, being humiliated or the United States being humiliated by a balloon. China's economic development since, you know, Nixon went there in the 70s has been astronomical. I mean, truly, like nothing I think the world has seen since the Industrial Revolution in terms of the speed at which uh, it has created industry and the wealth that it's generated. Like, they're doing unbelievably well. And the idea that somehow they're being humiliated economically, you know, we basically outsourced all of our manufacturing to them. And so I, I guess I'm not quite understanding their issue. I, I, I understand it in terms of Taiwan. What do you think is behind this sudden interest in the provocation cycle? Is it just that we no longer have the global war on terror to occupy ourselves with? Like what, what's behind this sudden uh, escalation on both sides? Yeah, I mean, there's probably a number of things going on. It's overdetermined. There's just different causes and conditions that produce this kind of escalation spiral. Mm-hmm. One is this weird moment that we're in. You know, I, I was uh, not a fan of the previous president by any means, but occasionally he you could catch him in some weird rhetoric where he didn't seem like he wanted to uh, continue global war. And I mean, his policies differed from his right. occasional rhetoric and his rhetoric differed, differed from his rhetoric. Uh, <laughs> he didn't know what he was talking about. But, you know, I think that there was a moment, there is there is a moment right. of post war on terror kind of we're the American people aren't really sure what we're up to in the world. They're not sure what gives drive and purpose to our foreign policy. And China represents something we can all kind of get around. You notice Biden is, is framing it as democracy and autocracy. You know, that's a way to frame the uh, rivalry that will get American support that appeals to our identity as democracy good guys right. and just shuts out any nuance about how we could possibly reach a, a strategic uh, agreement where we have peace as opposed to escalating spirals and p- possibly war. Right. And economic growth. I mean, we're, for God's sakes, we're already in a proxy war with Russia. Like that, that's already on, on the books. We are already, we're already in there. I mean, we've, we've gotten to the point where we're like, you can have tanks, but you can't have planes. Ah, you can have planes, but you can't have people. You'll have people. Like we're already in that proxy war cycle. Is this China trying to take advantage of that? Or is this just, uh, it's the only political way that these leaders feel like they get a win. Like how, I, I don't doubt that there are people that believe, uh, you know, very strongly that democracy and autocracy are at odds with each other. And I think they are. But a lot of the chaos that the United States interventions have caused has actually strengthened the hand of the autocrats because people turn to them in times of chaos. Jessica, is, is, are, are we in some ways the architect of our own uh, of our of our own precarious war position right now by destabilizing other parts of the world. I don't see leaders on either side looking to take advantage of the moment to instigate something. I see both sides really reacting in a kind of they feel that they have you know entirely innocent and all the blame lies on the other side but that they then are in this you know period of acute insecurity and thus 
need to react very strongly and do a lot to prepare for mm -hmm. a conflict that you know may not be inevitable but seems increasingly likely and i think it's that kind of mutual fatalism uh combined with a sense of you know extreme urgency that is kind of leading to sort of wayward statements and mm. that the about you know how you know such and such is coming down the pike but they see no alternative path you think jessica are there are fundamentally i think some irreconcilable uh objectives here particularly in the in the context of taiwan and mm -hmm. i think where they see the path for this sort of so-called peaceful uh, unification seeming less and less likely given demographic and political changes on the island of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so in that context, I think it's been much harder for, uh, you know, the Chinese leadership to tell their you know, people, like, and especially in the context of actions that the United States is also uh, undertaking, that, you know, that purely a peaceful a process will lead to their desired outcome. Now, this is not a change in their fundamental objectives. It's been what they want, uh, you know, really since the, it's an un, in their view, an unfinished civil war. Um, but this has really made it, you know, the sort of all the pillars of stability in the Taiwan Strait have really eroded, um, you know, first under the pressure of these you know, political changes in Taiwan, China's growing military capabilities. And then also, I think this reaction by the United States, which in turn is doing more to provoke and accelerate that erosion. Uh, than it is to really bolster deterrence as the United States keeps, you know, signaling that, um, you know, like, I mean, it's really hard because, you know, in a kind of clear moral picture, you know, Taiwan's a democracy, you know, China's the autocracy. Right. Why wouldn't you just do everything you could to support Taiwan? The problem with that kind of thinking is that you have to anticipate, okay, how is China going to react? And so when we think about what are the things that the United States can and should do to to support Taiwan, but without precipitating a worse reaction from China that actually pushes our the peace and stability prospect, you know, further and further away. So these kind of congressional visits to Taiwan, which are ostensibly to support the island, um, are actually more likely to precipitate the very kind of uh, military right. reaction that we saw after Speaker Pelosi, you know, went. And now we're going to maybe Speaker McCarthy, um, you know, where does this end? I mean, that is really the problem is that by putting so much attention uh, on this issue, we actually make it harder uh, to kind of, as they say, kick the can down the road to keep, uh, you know, alive the illusion and the prospect that one day, given, you know, political changes, developments that nobody can really foretell, there could be a peaceful process of some kind of rapprochement. You know, there's a lot of right. changes that have taken place in the island. And who knows what's happening in China either. Um, and so I think it's really important not to try to, you know, assume that this is going to all come to head in two years. I mean, this is dangerous because it, I think it will set in right. motion uh, potential actions by the United States, by actors on Taiwan. They're going to have a presidential election in 2024 as well. That could really just, you know, lead to the, a, a significant crisis here that I think we would be very hard pressed to maintain in the current circumstances. Right. John, that's, she brings up a really interesting point that you had touched on earlier. And I want to, I, I want to get back to a little bit, which is also the forces that exist outside of the political realm in terms of the media that are built to embrace crisis and catastrophe and urgency. I thought Wolf Blitzer was going to have a, maybe a four hour erection when he thought that they might shoot down the balloon. And he kept saying to every guest that came on, there was a, a general, an Air Force general, four star, who says we'll be at war with China by 2025. And the guests all had to be like, I think he was just talking to it, like trying to psych his guys up. Like, I don't think that's, he wasn't making that as a prediction, but it was every, but is it, are we heading to a conflict? But the question begs the issue of like, and if we are, should we cover it like this? There is atmospheric pressure. There is barometric pressure enforced by media uh, that this is a narrative, that this is a story, that this has an inevitable conclusion, and that by not going to war, it will be a disappointing finale. Yeah, I mean, the, the news media for sure is uh, kind of set up to amplify a lot of this threat inflation that we get from the government mm -hmm. um, on, on uh, national security threats. And they do. And even in the less 
a gross form, you know, the print form, basically. You know, <laughs> uh, broadcast journalism. That's how print <laughs> should advertise itself. The New York Times should say all the news that's less gross than the 24 hour news networks. Well, it is. It is less uh, egregious in yes. this particular sense than radio yes. and television. But, you know, also there are there are also incentives baked in there. Like if you're a reporter and you get, um, you know, a source providing you information that suggests a threat, you know, you're you're liable to give credit to those mm -hmm. uh, sources and those claims. I honestly think uh, a big part of the path to a stable relationship with China is coming to appreciate how much flexibility we have. The United States is a profoundly secure nation. Yes. Uh, we are uh, one of the richest in the world. We have a huge territory, lots of national resources. We have weak and pliant neighbors to the north and south and a bunch of fish to our east and west. Water perhaps, acts as a, Perhaps armed? Could you see us going to war? With the dolphin? Or perhaps armed fish. <laughs> yeah, the Chinese might put uh, some guns on a dolphin or something. But um, yes. no, we have an incredibly, we're a hegemon in our own hemisphere. Right. We have no challengers, you know. Uh, we have a nuclear deterrent, you know. Nobody's going to come marching onto the shores of Florida and take us over. We're incredibly secure. And yet everything that we perceive in the outside world is supposed to be this existential threat. Right. If we chill out, if we just calm down mm -hmm. and realize that we're actually really safe and secure, mm -hmm. I think it'll allow a lot more flexible posture with China, you know, where we can accommodate them in some respects and not in others. And that's a possible route to developing a stable relationship. But if we don't take a chill pill, I don't I don't see it happening. Chill pill. I don't. Yeah. Well, once when, when we're paying more to Lockheed Martin than we are for the entire State Department, I don't know if chill pills are on on order. But what about China? China is also incredibly secure. They, they have an enormous standing army. They have nuclear deterrence. They're a giant country. Nobody is going to overrun them. Uh, they're secure as well. And what I don't understand is whatever happened to the customer is always right. We are each other's best customers. It'd be like, you know, you've got a relationship with your local coffee shop and, and you guys, they sell you coffee and you sell them uh, cups. And yet you decide to go to war over seating by the window. Like it's none of this is existential to our, uh, to our freedoms. These are economic competitions. And I don't understand, like, who is going to buy all of China's stuff? Who is going to have them do all manufacturers if they go to war with the United States? Mm -hmm.